This is the picture uh, we all like to have about uh, sustainability, right? Um, it's a beautiful Tuscan uh, little village, and it looks like everything is in order since hundreds of years. And, you know, it's a wish of everybody probably to have a house in Tuscany, maybe when he goes in retirement, and somebody else before retirement. But let's see what really sustainable and sustainability means, and how, over time, the word was used. As you see uh, from the scale how it's increasing in the last years, until a couple of decades, nobody was really caring about the word sustainability. For hundreds of years, probably nobody used it. Probably it doesn't exist. And it's only like in the 70s that it began to be used and it is now very popular. And everything and everybody, uh, no matter what industry, no matter what you're, t you're talking about, you see sustainably popping up every second word. But inside the word sustainability, there are many other reasons um, that we should consider like uh, common sense. If it's not sustainable, it doesn't make sense. So why do we still con uh, conduct the same uh, wrong pattern and we do stuff which is not sustainable? It's because ecology and economy is the face of the same coin. That means that we cannot be ecological, sustainable, if, you are n if we are not economical, sustainable. But before I continue about sustainability, let me talk about my background and about this beautiful car here. In 2007, so seven years ago, I met with a Danish designer in California. Uh, the designer used to design for Aston Martin, and I, I guess you know the brand, beautiful cars, since many years. And he left Aston Martin because he had a dream. He had, like many, an American dream to be different, to do something that he was not allowed to do when he was working for Aston Martin. He was together with a long uh, uh, a colleague and a friend of long uh, tradition uh, in the car industry, and this guy was a German engineer, which he met at work about 25 years ago. So together, they decided to design a car, show it to people, and find the money to produce the car. So I heard about that, and I sold my company and invested the money. They convinced me and invested the money in the company. And it was amazing when I first visited uh, the design studio, there was a clay model, it was unfinished, it was not painted, but I was absolutely emotional about seeing this proportion, like a beautiful lady. And as you see here, you understand what I was obviously seven years ago feeling, and uh, I was already seeing myself driving the car actually. And I said, okay, no matter what, I'm giving the money to these people. And, and so we started. So from design to the first clay model to prototype, it was very exciting uh, because not many people have the luck or the chance to see something actually transforming from an idea into a product, into a finished product. But this is what uh, really was um, fundamental for us. Uh, people from Europe that went to the United States with a dream. So it's almost like a joke, right? I mean, you know, a Danish guy, a German engineer, and an Italian investor. Sounds like many jokes we do about European different countries. So this was not a joke. And so we went to raise money, and we found 
Luckily, enough people that trusted us and gave us lots of money. Making a car takes a lot of money, I tell you. We're talking about billions until you really get into the final production. And, you know, you want to scale it and you want to do, like, you know, thousands of cars, not just like one or two or three, because there are some little uh, car manufacturers. But, of course, you know, uh, they do not scale it down to mass production or what it should be a mass production. So when I was finally going back and forward between Europe and California, I was involved in the process of, you know, uh, researching for the materials. We wanted to do it sustainably. Uh, we wanted to use other materials, not, you know, avoiding plastic. So we decided to go with aluminum. Aluminum is very uh, cost-intensive and also energy-intensive, but you can recycle aluminum over and over again. So it's a good thing. And just to make you a little take, give you a little taste of what I was discovering over time, with the best of intentions, because we didn't want to really uh, abuse about the environment, and we didn't want to emit CO2 unnecessarily, we wanted to do it properly. So, in one of these occasions, I have this, uh, you know, uh, introduced, I was introduced into the um, interior design um, office, where people were looking to different pattern and different uh, materials and different fabrics and leathers, and it was like an explosion of ideas. So you have this pin board where everything is pinned, and every idea that comes through, you pin it, and you see the design of the shape of the dunes in the desert, or the eye of, a, of an animal, of a tiger. And then you get ideas, and then you pick the ideas, and you put it in a car, and then over the 3D programming, which is very, very sophisticated in the auto industry, you shape the car the way you want. So this designer comes to me and says, hey, Franco, look at that. I have this wonderful leather, and it comes from a farm in Scotland, and the cows, they're not killed, actually, uh, to get the leather, so, in this farm, they were waiting until the cow died of age. So, it was like a wellness for cows, you know? And I, I said, okay, that's a wonderful idea, that's very nice, it, it, it fits into our philosophy of a green car manufacturer. So, I said, and, and, how, is it, and, and how is it ultimately, how does it look? when it's inside a car. So she took this piece of leather and, and showed me, this is how I would put it in the car. There are scars, because everybody over our time, our lifetime, we get scars on our skin, and so do the cow. And the idea was to leave the scars of the cow in order to have a car individually for each of our customers. Another brilliant idea. So I said, what about the process? And she said, oh, you know, it's organic, meaning that there is no chemical, um, we don't spray it, because in the car industry, 90% of the leathers that you're sitting when you sit in a car are basically fake. I mean, it's not the best leather unless you take very high-end cars. The leather is really a cheap kind of leather, and then it gets sprayed, colored, like you would color fabric, color like you would color anything like the car itself. So we wouldn't do it. We would just use the natural organic material present and transform it to the, you know, to the, to the standard we wanted to reach. Later on, when we started to finally see the first deliveries of the car, we were, you know, as always, in, in, in when you do startups, we were late. We were running late. And we were running late two years, not two months. That means that we were burning money and cash like there is no tomorrow. And finally, I expected cars to arrive in the dealership. 
and still there was a delay. A delay for some reason. And I wanted to know what was the reason for this extra delay. And to my surprise, I discovered the journey that you see on my back. That's not the journey of a manager going to uh, do a speech or raising money like we, we had to do to convince people all over the world to put money in our company. This was the travel of our leather slash seat. Nobody was prepared in England. We couldn't find anybody that was able to actually make a seat with this leather because the standards were different. So what happened is that we had to take the leather from this happy cows, send it to East Europe, cut it, shape it, then send it to China. In China, they use it to put it on the frame. You know, there, there is a, a metal frame, there is some foam, otherwise it would be too stiff to sit, and then you cover it with fabrics or leather. In this case, it's the leather, the famous leather. From China, from this factory in China, the, the seat, the completed seat, went again back to Europe in Finland because we had uh, the, uh, the, the factory that was assembling the cars in Finland. So we use this because this is a large factory that is used by other manufacturers when they are, you know, either uh, they don't own uh, a factory or they need, uh, because of overcapacity, they need to produce it somewhere else. So you can imagine now that I was very surprised and also upset because we do everything to be sustainable. We want to have the right product and then we find that this seat was burning CO2 like a power plant. So it wasn't a sustainable seat even though the leather was sustainable. So this is the concepts we have today sometimes when we buy stuff and it has all sustainability um, kind of, um, you know, stamp, and we don't know the background because we don't know the story. And here, something else that we have to consider. Uh, when I turn on the TV, and I guess the same happens to you, what I hear from our politicians that lack leadership is growth. We have to grow. So we have a crisis, what do we have to do? Grow, just grow. Uh, but, 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 but how? You know, uh, if I don't have the money to spend, how can I grow? And there is no answer. I haven't heard since 2007, 2008, since the crisis we had, the, the most recent crisis we had, I didn't hear anybody talking about a vision. You know, I think we have to go this way. I haven't heard it, maybe you. So what I think is that we have to move away from accounting our economy by the GDP. And why? Because the GDP, uh, I don't know how many of you know that if we have an earthquake, the GDP goes up. Did you know it? If we have a natural catastrophe, that costs life, GDP goes up because we spend money to repair it. So it doesn't really make sense. Somebody else, very smart in Italy, came up with the idea to account to the GDP the black money. Because, you know, the black money is not accounted, but we know it exists. So to have an artificial way to grow the GDP, to say, oh, we have increased the GDP by 2%, so let's account the black money. Let's account the crime money too, so we have a growth. I mean, that's totally nonsense. And for that reason, I think we have to move to, move to the GPI, which is the genuine, uh, um, genuine, indicator, genuine progress indicator, which takes into account everything I was listening before. So the time you commute, so when you commute, it's a waste of time. If to go to the place you work, home, and from home to work, 
you spend five minutes, if you are in a little town like Graz, maybe, or if you are in a big town like Los Angeles, where the daily commute is two hours a day, two hours a day. This is a waste, and this is money. If you take time, as it is money, you have to deduct, actually, this from the GDP. Because you're not producing, you're just consuming. And like, like the commuting time, there is crime, which costs to the society, and a lot of other indicators that you can read uh, from the slide behind me. So if we really take this and, and put a value and see over time from the 50s to today, you see that we basically didn't grow. I mean, to have three televisions instead of one, three cars instead of one, doesn't mean we grow. We consume more, but we don't grow. So to use something that really accounts of the real growth, we have to rethink about how to account our growth. And of course, you know, uh, how do you want to change if you don't challenge yourself? There is no way we can have a change if we don't challenge. And it's for this reason that, of course, you will have a lot of naysayers, a lot of people that will say, oh, it's difficult. Oh, you know, I, I'm just alone. I'm a single man or I'm a single woman. I cannot change anything. <laughs> well, at least we can change ourselves. At least we can start in thinking, maybe I have to do something for myself. If I don't do it for the others, I want to do it for myself. And it's a challenge, like a sport challenge, like if you decide at age 40, because you, know, you turn 40 today and you, know, you want to prove that you're still young, and you say, hey, I'm training for the marathon. So you challenge yourself, and you want to prove that even though you just turned 40, you're still in good shape. And here a little example. There is a lot going on all over the world, believe me. Uh, the more I was digging in into preparing the speech of today, the more I have discovered that there are a lot of people that think in a similar way like me. And what I have discovered doing all these researches is that at the MIT, uh, there are a group of scientists that um, are uh, looking to change the way we can store energy. Because if we have energy, it does mean we have it when we need it. Especially if we think about renewable. So if you have renewable, and let's presume you have a house, you have your solar roofs, and you produce more energy during the day than you actually consume, what you now typically have, you are connected to the grid. So you give it to the grid, and then at night, when there is no more sun, the grid gives you back just the amount you need. So if I would like to transform this system, this grid system, this grid system, of course, needs to be, you know, maintained, increased, uh, developed, uh, it goes long distances. Uh, you have a country like Italy that decided not to go nuclear, right? But we take nuclear from France because we cannot produce energy enough for ourselves. And we have this nuclear plant right uh, uh, on the border between Italy and France, but on the French side, which travels all the way to Italy. So this has a huge cost. So what if anybody of you in the near future maybe think about building a house? Try to make it, and there are already all the technologies available for doing it, energy independent. And how? Well, you know, you take a technician and you see what is your consumption. Let's presume it, it, it's six kilowatt. Okay, a, a little house, six kilowatt, that's okay. You put up the panels, and then you produce the six kilowatt you need. But during the night, you would need again to be fed by the grid. But 
in your cellar, which you here in Styria typically have, you have wine, speck, maybe, right? Think about if you add another little room where you have a battery. So the energy that you overproduced, which you don't consume, goes into this battery. And this guy, uh, this professor um, in, 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 at the MIT and his team, find out that we can use actually soil. So what you have in your backyard, uh, you know, the earth, inside there are minerals. And of course you can take then, uh, extract copper or iron or whatever you find. It depends, of course, of the environment. So these researchers at the MIT find a way to extract these components to make a battery. In order to be able to produce batteries all over the world, not only you know, in America, and then you produce it there, you ship it to Europe, and then you ship it to Asia, and so on and so forth. But everybody can produce this battery. This battery, which is tested already several years, in laboratory tests, showed that it actually is going to last 300 years. If you see the graph here, 300 years. The fading after 300 years is 80%, is 20%, sorry. So that means that the capacity of storage stays intact 80% for 300 years. And I think it's a fairly long time. So you see, there are already technology available today. And it's not going to happen overnight, but you can start with yourself. Another way to come up, come up with the... Um, I see the time is over. <laughs> okay, <laughs> is to go into local community in producing, you know, there are uh, towns like uh, San Francisco and, uh, and other, many other towns uh, where are using actually the gardens uh, to, produce, um, to produce vegetables. And what I think and I believe is that we have to be more local than actually global, and think about how our strength was built up over time. It doesn't mean that we have to be provincial, but you know, we have to use the network of internet, etc., open source, and exchange all information. Okay, the last doesn't go. I would like to end with something that really care um, or somebody actually that really cared about the environment it was the real first environmentalist uh, already in the 40s when nobody was talking about it and is Mahatma Gandhi and he said the world is big enough for everybody but it will be always too small for somebody with greed thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you.